Because I think, like, you, I, would, I would, I'd personally say that you're pretty much a, a GBWC veteran. Like, you've seen it come and go. You've seen it sort of go a few times. You've experienced that seven ways to get a golden ticket sort of thing. So, <laughs> and then we can yeah. talk, you are the Willy Wonka of American GBWC. Just, <laughs> just got to get that golden ticket, Jordan. You got to get one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no worries. I won't take you, Andy. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'll tell you what, when I, when I look at you there, you're like Jack Black, young Jack Black. <laughs> I, I think I've heard the Jack Black one like once or twice. Yeah, even some of the other photos with shorter hair. I was like, that's a young Jack Black there. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Good morning, good evening, and good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Gunplay Insider. Thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Tiller. Uh, this is a little chat that I have with um, some great builders, some great people for the Gunplay Network. Uh, tonight we've got uh, with us Jordan Nydert. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to Jordan. You're going to get to see this fellow. You're going to get to meet this fellow. You're going to get to know him a little better than you have before. Um, before I do go on, we've got a couple of sponsors. Uh, Robo City. Uh, great guys there, an Australian company that um, pushes Gunpla globally. And we've also got Cloud Communications that look after my VMR and my camera gear. So thanks to those guys. This is uh, all possible. So um, it's the end of 2018. We've seen GBWC come and go. And once again, we've seen Jordan throw something on the table that is absolutely phenomenal. Um, Jordan, mate, thanks for taking the time to... Uh, it's in the afternoon there, it's early here. Buddy, thanks for taking the time to come and have a chat with us. Can you just sort of introduce yeah. yourself and, uh, yeah, make yourself welcome, mate. Come on in. All right. Uh, well, as Scott here said, my name is Jordan, but a lot of you in the community probably know me as Ed. I'm the uh, I'm the guy who makes the dirty train robots. Um, <laughs> uh, big fan of Gunflow Network. I've been in there for a long time. Uh, good Facebook group, so I'm, I'm always happy to... Uh, to uh, do anything involved with them and everything. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, and just uh, a, a bit what you do outside Gunplay, Jordan, so we can sort of get, so we know you're a real person because some of the yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like cyborg like. <laughs> uh, so I am a social media and marketing manager for a cleaning company in Pennsylvania, and I'm also the head office manager there. So I do a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> and recently I, uh, I'm applying actually to be a prototype finisher for a figure company in Japan, but well, it's, okay. uh, it's a job in America, but they need somebody to finish prototype models for them. So I'm not going to say the company yet cause I don't want to uh, have too much competition, <laughs> but, yeah. um, it's, uh, I'm hoping that goes through cause it looks like a fun job and, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to kind of get more into, something away from marketing and more into like getting my hands on something to work with it and uh yeah that sounds yeah, like a uh, dream right like so you're talking about yeah, yeah. 3d modeling and sort of finishing the, the models off like that um no like actual like physical pieces like working on the prototype right. like figures and all that and uh it would be like kind of finishing like small proportion mods and, you know, sanding and kind of buffing the dents out and everything like that. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> did, 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 did this opportunity come up as a result of a certain interview with a certain norm from tested recently? Is there any link? There? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I wish, um, no, just my, uh, top, top Adam out just, you know, like he's like, I just got this little thing going on over here. <laughs> uh, no, for a friend of mine, uh, from the community posted it to me and uh she said hey this is in japanese but when you translate it like the application is pretty much like the stuff that you do so she figured she's like this would be a good job for you so she sent it to me but i uh i, I wish norm would call me for a job i'd love that i'd love to work with uh 
with the crew a little more again. That was fun. So. It's such a good thing what they do, isn't it? Like, it's so diverse and stuff. Like, they, even when they, I listen to their podcast all the time, and I listen to Adam say, who, who doesn't? If you don't, you're missing out. But just their, yeah. their way of covering life in general and just ticking all the, the nerdy techie boxes without kind of getting too consumed, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, look, we're going to... um sort of kick straight off with this year's um, GBWC entry for you. Now, I did go through um, on your Facebook, and we'll, we'll sort of show people where you, they can go and see more later. Um, and you've got so many photos, and they're all amazing, and I sort of had to cut it a bit, at like sort of around 160 or something like that, well, 25 or something <laughs> like, because there's just so much detail. And um, I'll just start flashing through them. Like I said before, there's, there's a little bit of a delay, um, so what you see might be a few seconds behind what I see. And, um, yeah, you can just start talking about, I guess, you know, lots of people will want to hear the technical stuff, but for me and probably some of my people that I share this with, it's more so about just the feel and the story. And, you know, we, if you don't know, Jordan loves trains and it's, you're that one guy that makes trains cool. There's no doubt about that (laughs) because trains are usually like, you know, old dudes with little round glasses and they wear the hats and stuff and, Right. It, it astounds me the way that you can push these two totally different genres and hobbies. You know, like it's trains are all about scale, and you know, there's probably some train enthusiasts out there that are like watching you do this and going, "What? There's you can't do that," and you do it, and it's freaking beautiful. Oh, yeah. So, so <laughs> we'll, we'll go through a couple of um, your builds, from one previous as well. But just just talk to us about how it all works for you and um, and for those that are interested, you do have a pretty good album of the build whip. And, um, yeah, the way you're slapping stuff together. This is what amazes me the most about what you guys do is how you kind of take stuff and you put a bit of cardboard here and a bit of tube and stuff and you're already skinned it and you sort of know where you're going. <laughs> you guys say you don't, but you're just you're following the four cents. <laughs> it's incredible. So, um, yeah, yeah, basically, um, yeah, just start talking to us about this guy, mate, and, and how it all went for you this year and, you know, where, where it sits in your list of achievements and that sort of stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I do, you know, for those who know me, every single year since I started competing in GBWC, aside from my very first year, um, but the past four years, all my entries have had something to do with trains. There has been something in the the piece that involves a train in some way. Um, I put train track in a bridge too far, so that was like a very little little bit of it but the year before that i had uh two mobile suits fighting and it was like kicking one of the trains off the track um steam siege uh, you know when you show that off i'll I'll get more of the details of that but that was a very train incorporated build and saisei saisei was kind of born from the whole steam siege thing because i loved the i loved the units that i built for steam siege but i was kind of upset because after GBWC, uh, my dioramas are always like set in stone. Like you can't move them afterwards. You can't remove any of the pieces. And I really wanted a standalone steam engine guy to play with and like fiddle around with. So I was like, all right, I'm going to build one kind of not, you know, flying around in the, in the air, you know, cutting things up or whatever. I'm going to build a standalone unit that I can move around and pose as I please and do different things with. And I decided to make it uh, a bit bigger this year instead of doing, I, I've always done high grades. This is the first year I did a, um, like a one to 100 scale. And I just, I, you know, the thing is like, I love the aesthetic of like the steam engine boiler in the chest. I, you know, I, that's the, this is the third time I've built one like that. And, um, you know, I just, I wanted to make a, another steam engine guy and I wanted to make him a samurai because the other guy is, that I've built weren't really themed after anything. They were just steam engine mechs, which is fine. But I wanted to make a guy that was like, he, he sort of had three themes with him. So this guy, you know, he's a Gundam, he's a steam engine thing, and he's also a samurai. So I want to kind of incorporate those three things into it. Um, and the, the name behind it, Saisei, actually, it means rebirth in Japanese. And when I did steam siege it burnt me out really bad um mainly because i built it kind of you know i I always had a lot of fun with it but i really feel like i built it with just the intention of like 
I want to win GBWC, like my local with this. Like, I don't think I, I, I ever have a chance in Japan, but like, I wanted to try and like beat New York, like where I compete every year. Yeah. And it, it really burned me out. <laughs> um, again, I had, I have so much fun every year building these things, but really when it comes down to the, uh, the final month or two, you know, it's, it's this funny period of where I go into, uh, overdrive and my whole life is just consumed by this project and steam siege took such a long amount of time with that. And when I was done with it, all things said and done and I finished the competition, I, I really got burnt out from Gunpla for a really long time. And over the past year, I've done a lot. Um, I finally moved out. My girlfriend and I got our own place. Um, I have a studio now, which is really nice. Um, and I kind of had to rekindle my love for the hobby in this, in this way where I almost had to like reteach myself how to enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I stepped away from it for a while and then I came back and as I was building Saise, I was like, okay, this year I had no, I actually had no intention of placing this year the whole build as i say was i just wanted to have fun with it i wanted to put something nice in the case for people to see but i wasn't being competitive with others i was being more competitive with myself which is like all right like let's let's build something cool and put it on display and you know like let, let's put something nice out into the world and, and again it was like a lot of people think it's like a very competitive thing where I was like, oh, well, he was like staying up all night and like slamming energy drinks and like, you know, just working his butt off on this thing to like finish it by GBWC. And it's obvious that he's like trying to be very competitive with it. And it was less about me being competitive. It was more like, I just want to finish this thing so I can like put it on display mm. at this event and have people come and see it and, you know, have fun with it. Yeah, sure. And um, as I was building it, I realized, you know, this is almost like my rebirth into the hobby because, I, I, you know, I, I've left, not like left, but I've taken breaks here and there. But this one really feel, you know, I, I again, I have this this new studio set up. I have this sort of, you know, reintroduction to everything. And I thought, you know, so I say it kind of fits. It means rebirth. And it, somebody, um, it was funny, I, I typed it accidentally wrong on a, a Facebook page and I typed say Sai. And uh, seisai means, I believe it means uh, like death or decay in Japanese. Oh. And somebody was like, oh, he must have named it that because it's all battered and rusty and like falling yeah. apart and because it's like a yeah. steam engine. <laughs> and I was like, no, it was a, it was a typo, but that's kind of, you know, it kind of fits. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, more about the, the actual build. Um, steam engines obviously are a, uh, a very outdated sort of form of engine or you know transportation technology it's it's very outdated so i always felt like rusty steam engine kind of went together and it, it's the funny thing is i i always get these comments and, um, everyone always says it's steampunk and everyone's like, "Oh, it's steampunk," and I'm like, "It's not steampunk," but I like I don't you know I don't want to correct people or anything but like uh, i never really try to like do the steampunk thing it's just more about a, just yeah. a steam engine slapped onto a robot but it's just, it's yeah, just it makes sense it's just, just unfortunate there's already a genre and most people will like it's to, <laughs> to be honest i think it'd be better if someone said steampunk and someone says oh is that a transformer because that's what hurts the most yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was so, um just think yourself lucky that was a big thing I got last year. A lot of comments were like, oh, these look like train transformers. And I'm like, do they? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, somebody was like, oh, I see the theme that you're going with. You're trying to build like train transformer guys. Like, and you nailed that theme. And I was like, that's not what I was going for. But you know what? If, if that's what you see it as, then that's yeah. what you see it as. And that's cool with me. So um, the, the, another funny thing about the the, the concept of this build that I don't, I didn't talk too much about. Um, it originally had this big tree, uh, that I was going to build with it. And I don't have it with me at the moment. It's in my, my attic, but, uh, the build was originally this, this huge base and it had this like tree that was about this tall. Wow. And I scratch built the whole thing. I sculpted the whole thing. And about two, three nights before the event, I was putting the flocking on it and I was like finishing it up. And I said, I don't like this anymore. So I scrapped it, 
went down the road to the craft store and I bought like this big stack of all these, uh, all these wooden bases, like all these little basic wooden bases. Really? And I'm like, I want to do this. I want to make it, I want to make it from scratch. I want to restart the base cause I didn't like it. And, uh, I was messaging my friend, uh, Win M. Ong. He's the guy who placed third this year. Uh, yeah. He's won GBWC before. Uh, him and I are very good buddies, and he helps me a lot with my projects. Um, and he was like, he was like scrambling online, like looking at all these cool bases, and he's like, "You can get to, like one day shipping here." He's like, "Do you have time to order this?" And I was like, "I leave for the competition in like 36 hours." And he's like, "You have time to order this one here? I'll find this one for you." So like we're like going back and forth, like trying to find these bases to work. And uh, that night I stayed up and I went through four bases i tried doing four different bases and this was the one that i finally ended up Holy. uh l- liking um yeah like this one you know i tried to like do another one that had like a curve on the track and like i didn't like that one so i slapped it aside and then i was thinking like oh i could get this blank base and he's and i was thinking about building this thing with like i, I went out and i bought uh thirty dollars worth of all these these metal cogs and like yeah. these little uh, these yeah. little wheel things, and I was like, oh, I could build like this this cool like this uh, kind of like Game of Thrones chair with all these cog pieces or something, and then like have them all like hovering on these like metal spikes. And then I was like, nah, screw that. So I ended up I ended up with this, um, and uh, it really you know I, I I feel like in a way you know when you're building something like this, the, the Gundams kind of tell you if they like it or not. And this, you know, Saisei so was like, I don't like this one. I don't like this one. Okay. And uh, he likes this one. So I went with this one. The, um, the bases and- are always an interesting aspect of a build. And I've had this discussion with a number of people. And uh, like, I've only been, come in about two weeks, I've only been ever even aware of Gun- Gunpla for like 12 months. And so my GBWC this year was seeing our Australian guy, Aaron Simmons, Simons. Hmm. And, um, he the sledgehammer and his base. The story is, you know, it was too tall, so he had to sink it in and stuff like that. But like yours, right. his base is his base. Um, it just accentuates and goes with the build. And like you said, you know, you could have done a throne of cogs, and the eyes kind of do other stuff. And you, you could have done this, you could have done that. But you've definitely gone with a base that a he likes because that's really important, and b a base that just allows the model to be. It's really it's not the um you know GBWC isn't about base building. It's sometimes I think the diorama thing. It's almost going to, in my opinion, just even just as as an adult that kind of was probably confused between Transformers and Gundam. You know, eighteen months ago when i first looked at gbwc i was like it looks a lot like a golden demon type competition where you know you've got all the warhammery stuff and it's all like you said there's lots of things are being built and they'll never move again and there's statues yeah and the kit doesn't seem to be a kit anymore and even though it was bashed and changed and stuff so you know like you said you've sort of had that revolution where you're like i want it just to be a kit on a base and the base isn't the point and um, I, I can mean, yeah. as a person, I can say what I like. As my personal, what I like to see in GBWC entries, that's the sort of stuff that I think really kills it for me. So, hey, yeah. well done. Thank you. Yeah, you know, everybody, everybody has their likes and their dislikes, and um, right. you know, I think it's, I think it's great that uh, there's so many different things in GBWC that you see, and there's really something for everybody to enjoy. Yeah. And uh, I like that. I like I like the variety of entries that we see, you know. Yeah. And you know, not not everything walks away with an award, but you. The, the big thing is like, you may not have won an award, but somebody may have seen your work and been really inspired, and somebody may have seen your entry and thought like, to them, that was the coolest thing that they saw there today. Yeah. So I think that's important to remember. Like, you might not walk away with like. A piece of metal but you may have left somebody with something like way way stronger than any kind of award that could ever you know be crafted yeah so. and even at, at a lower sort of uh, skill level like i did mine this year i took a gm sniper two and you know he's in amongst, yeah. Some, yeah, he's in amongst some pine trees and um you know i got those little ho cows and they all sort of stand around him in the grass you know it's like for me it was just to have it in the cabinet, so we only get about 120 entries in Australia. You know, it's growing every year, but it was right at the front mm. 
the Smash Anime Festival. So every person that came there to dress up like Sailor Moon went in, got their wrist wrap, walked straight through the Bandai banner past all these kits. And then yep. every two days, there's everybody standing around, they're standing near my kit and that kit, and you're like, there's a little seven-year-old kid there that's interested in Dragon yeah. Ball, looking at everybody's kits going, whoa, you know, and that's, that's just taking them out and not stuck on a PlayStation, they're not doing this. For me, GBWC, my first one, and probably from here on, will be much more like a, a festival-type situation as opposed to a competition where half a dozen people have got a, got a shot of it, you know, out of everybody. Right, yeah. It's much more fun, I think, if you can focus on that aspect. I know... Um, we uh, we'll just pop off that for a sec. Let me talk a little bit about your GBWC process in the US. is complex. Like I said, we just kind of rock up on a Saturday, or you rock up on a Friday. You put your kid in the next day. Kawaguchi rocks around, and everybody's like, Ooh! and then you know by that afternoon, someone's going to Japan. Uh, right. it's, it's not like that for you guys at all, is it? It's much more complex and probably much more emotionally charged over a longer period of time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so how it works over here is that um, GBW, GBWC is never by itself. It's always at some sort of anime convention or something like that. Because Bluefin is the company that has done it for the past. I, I don't think they've always done it, but since they were a thing, they've kind of run GBWC over here. And so, what it is is uh, it's it's at every single it's at a convention, but we don't have like one or two. Like other countries do, we have seven. So we have six in-person events, and then we have an online entry. I, I believe it's six. The last time I checked, it was six. Um, and I'll, it was funny because, um, you know, there, there was a lot of, you know, talk this year about, like, the judges and, like, why, you know, certain people are at the events and why other people are at different events. Um, and somebody somebody made a comment saying, like, Oh, like, where, uh, like, what, you know, they're they like nitpicking a model and they said something about, like, oh, why didn't, like, Kawaguchi catch this? And I said, Kawaguchi doesn't come to all of our events. He only comes to one. Mm. Um, and that's Anime Expo over in, um, California. He doesn't come to the other five. So yeah. he doesn't see the other five entries. He's only at one of them. And, uh, basically, so, you know, you have, six or seven however many best of show people from each uh competition and then you have to wait till december to figure out which one of those seven is going to go to japan so you kind of have this extra step that other gbwcs don't have yeah, really like um, just to get outside the country sort of thing yeah 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 and uh you know it, it's i understand it because america's so big and we have, you know, they're, they're spread out all over the place. And a lot of people can't afford to just come out to, you know, New York or L.A. or whatever just for a weekend for this thing. So they get a lot. They get a lot more entries, I think, when they have so many different places. But there also is a problem spreading it too thin where you have too many events in too many places and I think, you know, a lot of them are kind of centralized around the same area. And I think if they kind of cut those down and just made them at one big event, they'd get all the people back at the big event. It works as a bit of a filter, too, I suppose, that if you can just kind of... Um, the whole, like, one online competition for me is a bit odd. Uh, this, this, A, you can get things that like as a very amateur builder there's people who have looked at my like, photos i put up on facebook and like oh man that's rad and i'm like it's plastic with top coat and a bit of dry brushing and stuff it's like it's all about the trickery of the lights so i could right I could, could get my foot in the door but at the same time the other end of it is that um stuff that is up in flesh is just so phenomenally amazing that you just don't pick like the Exia from Japan this year. It's like, oh yeah, I'm not an Exia fan, but it was like, oh yeah, uh, I guess. And someone's like, did you actually look at that kind of like carbon fiber type paint job on that thing? Yeah. Close. And the way the light would have hit that and the way it would have actually just uh, as a presence, it just, the online thing to me seems like in some ways you're going to advantage some people that probably aren't quite there and you're going to disadvantage some people that just can't quite be there so it's a real shame but like you said 
if you could get everybody into do they have any like in the center like central us or is it all kind of like coastal generally um i'm i'm trying to think of i honestly i don't even know where uh all of them are held i know that one of them is at Otakon, which is in D.C., so that's kind of over on our coast. And then uh, they moved our New York one from Comic-Con. It was originally a New York Comic-Con. They moved it to a new convention called Anime NYC. Um, so it's like the same venue. It's just a month later, and it kind of has a different crowd. And that's in New York. And I know the other one of them is in L.A. And... I'm trying to remember where the other ones are located. I believe there's there's one in Texas, um, and then I can't remember the idea, the last two are, but uh, I you know they're they're really at the middle as far as like the mid cent of the country goes. Um, I think Texas might be the most like center mid one. Um, I'm not entirely yeah. sure, but I, you know it, it's it's spread out, but at the same time I feel like they could spread it out better. Like, instead of just having it kind of clumped on each side of the country, it could kind of be pinpointed at different yeah, spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, th- again, that also completely depends on, like, what anime conventions are happening because they only do it at anime conventions, so. That's right. So you've, you've been, um, you, you had a bit of a hiatus, and you said, like, last year was a bit, a bit epic for you, but you've been at, when was your first GBWC? Oh, uh, man. <laughs> That was back in 20, 2013, 2014. Yeah. Um, let me look real quick. I, I, have a I, don't, up I, I don't want to dwell on GBWC because there's more to Jordan than just GBWC. Like, I think there's... Yeah, yeah. Just, it just, um, like, these, these situations bring out things in people, you know, and they push you. Mm-hmm. A Bridge Too Far, was that, that was, a GB, was that a GBWC entry? Yes, um, oh, that was a GBWC entry. Because, that was back in... Same as before, yeah, uh, these picks up. So you just flick through it, and um, yeah, I know you've probably talked about this one quite a bit now because this was a few years back. But yeah, tell us a bit about this and what you, what so you reflect that... on. You know, like Jordan now. You know, having been through Steam Siege and then Sai Sai. I really want to say that properly now, not say Sai because that's not true. Sai so Sai. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, like how you because I know, like I saw this. I saw you talking about this style. Um, on Gumpler Talk, and you were talking about using just paints from the craft store and bits and pieces and stuff, and you had some dramas, and you worked through it. It seemed to be a real... Um, I think that was maybe the time when you kind of went, whoa, this... And you really got the bull by the horns, and that kind of maybe that's where you got, <laughs> that's where you got hooked a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I've always kind of made this joke that um, you know, a lot of people kind of contribute build fighters to GBWC, but the funny thing is the battle doesn't happen at GBWC like it does in the show. Mm. The battle is the months beforehand. The battle is getting your your entry and your kit done. <laughs> so um, that year, I built that piece in ten days because that was the time limit I had. Because at the time, uh. I was living in New York and my girlfriend lived in Pennsylvania and my whole setup was in New York. So we got to New York cause I was with my girlfriend for a while and her car, um, she needed a new car and we couldn't drive her car back to my house to get my supplies. So we were basically stuck in Pennsylvania and she got a car. We loaded it up. We went to New York. We were in New York for three days and those three days while I was in New York and I had my setup, I built those three kits, sanded them, uh, seam fixed them, and laid all of the base paintwork on the entire thing there. Um, so I painted and like finished the kits. Not that like all the weathering, the details, and the decals or anything, but the paint job, the basic paint job, I did in uh, three days. You know, again, all the seam fixing, everything, and we packed up all of my stuff and we put it in her car and we drove her car six hours to her house in Pennsylvania. So we get to Pennsylvania. We took her laundry room, her parents' laundry room, and we set everything up in there. And we, we kind of, you know, got the spray booth. We like clamped the, you know, thing down. We put like plastic wrap over everything. So we didn't get anything dirty. And, uh, we sat there for 10 days and we built our entries. (laughs) Um, and somewhere in between, uh, 
getting her thing finished and putting some more paintwork on mine, my air compressor finally died. So we had to go out and find a new one. Um, <laughs> so her and her dad went like two hours, some direction to this craft place and found a really good compressor, bought it, brought it back. So we got that situation handled. Um, the water effects, because the whole thing is like in a, in a sort of like water basin sort of area. Um, all of the water that I poured originally, I didn't get the right bottle of water effects. And it was a slow pour, thin thin pour kind of water made for making little puddles. Right. And the water is like an inch deep. So I poured it. And I was like, all right, just got to wait for it to cure. And uh, Henry, Vegeta8259, messaged me, and he's like, that water is not going to dry. Like, it's going to take like a month for that to dry. You need to pour it out and, like, go get something else. So we dumped all of that out, and we went to this store near us, and we got some clear resin. Have never had any work with resin at that point in my entire life. So we bought this big vat of, like, clear resin, mixed it all up, dumped it in there. Um, and the house smelled horrible. We had to like open all the windows and like take my entry outside because it just stunk so badly because we didn't realize we got like the high odor resin. <laughs> um, so we did, we did that. And, uh, you know, I was up pretty much when I do GBWC, my schedule goes from, you know, you go to work, you come home, you go to sleep, you wake up for work the next day. That's like the normal schedule. With GBWC, I go to work. I take a nap, I get up at around 10, I stay up all night, and then I go to work, and mm-hmm. then I come home, nap, rinse and repeat. So that's my that's my process whenever uh, I'm like in crunch time for GBWC. And so I remember still doing, doing that. Like, like, yeah, that's still your process? Yep, that's still my process. Uh, and it's it's gotten nice because uh, where we live now, we have like a little convenience store, like right near my apartment. So, you know, four in the morning, if I, you know, I'm in the middle of this like intensive build session, I'm like, all right, I got to go get like a, you know, some, you know, a little snack, a little pick me up. So I'll go over there get a snack, come back, hammer it out, you know, work until the sun rises. And, uh, it's, it's funny. It's, it's happened to me several years now, but there's a moment that I l- love, I think more than anything. A lot of people ask me like, Oh, what's your favorite part about like your GBWC builds or what's your favorite part about Gunpla builds? My favorite part is when I finish the kit because I always finish it right before the sun comes up. And I always take a photo of it when it's finished outside with like the sun rising near it. Beautiful. And I realized I've done that for the past couple of years. And like this year, it really caught up to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, like I did this again. And like there's this sort of like this lull in the morning when you're like it's like 8 a.m. And you finally like finished your piece and it's like sitting there in front of you and you're all sleep deprived and you're like, you're tired as hell, but it's like, I did it. And the sun came up and I did it, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, with, with a bridge too far, it was, it was, uh, we went through trials trying to get all the, uh, the pieces to finish that thing. And, uh, I'm really happy that, you know, if that resin hadn't poured right, you know, if one thing had gone too much more wrong, I don't think I would have finished it, but you know, the stars aligned and I managed to kind of get it together and uh, complete it. <laughs> I'm always most amazed about um, with water effects. Like it's all amazing, but what amazes me the most is I'm not sure if this picture's a, you can see it, but it's the uh, the close up to the water and it's just focused on the feet, and you can sort of see mm. it's like he's just stepped in. Or he's in the mo- in the motion of moving out. It's actually kind of like splashing out. There's like little ripples. Like, yeah, how, uh, it's his left foot specifically. How do you get it to to kind of like defy gravity like that? Um, I don't want so to get the- but that always amazes me when people can do that. Like dudes do rain and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. What are balls? And he's like, what the hell? Um, so basically the, the pore of the, the main resin is just kind of like the, the base, you know, the flat, like water and the effects are, I don't have it near me, but we, uh, my girlfriend and I both use this cause my girlfriend builds ice dioramas. So she works with a lot of like clear water effect and stuff like that. Right. Um, it's this sort of like, it's almost like toothpaste sort of like oh. stuff and you, you put it down and you sculpt it. And you shape it how you want it to be, and you can like build it up in chunks and stuff, and it dries clear. 
So you kind of get like the splashing effects and like, I really built it up on like the leg there where it's like coming up doing that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. uh, I, that's actually that, that diorama that we're looking up together. That's the first time I ever did anything with resin or with water effects. I was just kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing, but it <laughs> looks all right. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, so uh, yeah, it's just, it's like this clear kind of like paste stuff. And um you can put it, it's, it's cool. Cause it, again, it dries clear. You can put it on like wax paper and you can shape it to be kind of like icicles or raindrops or like water, you know, fall effects and it dries and it's kind of like it, it's rubbery. It like, you can move it around yeah. and uh, you can pe- again, you peel it off and you can kind of like glue it down and sculpt it where you want it to be on the water or on like, you know, the leg and the land there and everything. So, and then how do you get the kind so, of body color to it? Uh, the mud was just clear brown. Uh, I sprayed clear brown paint on it with an airbrush, and uh, the, the the in the water, I I painted the whole thing. I mean, it it really what a lot of people do to try to add depth when they pour water is they paint it to be like a dark blue or a black, like yeah. in the water basin, and then they they put the water effect on top of it. It looks really deep. I just, I made it look like mud really the whole thing. Yeah. And then when the water dried clear, it was like, it just looked like a, like a muddy kind of water basin sort of thing. And then with the, the effects on top, um, again, I took clear kind of like greenish Brown and I kind of shaded the water almost in this weird kind of, you know, Again, kind of, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just spraying it and it looks all right, kind of. Oh, it looks super murky. There's, you would not eat a fish you caught out of that river. It looks so good. Not to mention there's been a couple <laughs> of big mechs stomping through it. So it's sort of still, I love how it's like, it's like splashed up on the bank and everything. It's just such a sense of, yeah. of action in this, in this dye. Like some of them are sort of like, um, it's almost like a snapshot and everything's still, but this one's, yeah, made, yeah. It's, it's a real sense of, it's the dude's in the dude's in a lot of trouble. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah, so I, I you mentioned before, like um talking about Wynn. Um yeah, look, Wynn's such a rad dude. I um I interviewed yeah. him a, a while ago and I've sort of been in touch with him and I saw I remember ages ago seeing his paint pusher stuff and just thinking, What the hell? What is what is what is this about? You know, and and this <laughs> It doesn't surprise me at all that you, um, you know, you sort of draw and win, and uh, like you're your own, you are Jordan, but you know, to think that you know, win is someone you can lean to, because you guys both have a similar style of, um, like, even the way you talk is like, uh, I do, there's nothing technical. I just kind of pick up the just brush, <laughs> and I think I think that brush is a bit big, so I grab a smaller one and then rub it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, like, you guys have this real sense of, um, like. Like, Wynn will sort of say to you, oh, I've, I've never really made, I don't want to quote him, but the impression I get, my interpretation is like, I've never really made mistakes. Um, there's been yeah. things that haven't worked out to what I thought was going to happen. And the stories sometimes become a little bit telling themselves. Like, it's interesting when you said, uh, I was, I stood, I finished with this base because the Gundam liked it. You know, there's a lot more to, <laughs> there are some builders out there that are all about using tiny guillotines and cutting plate to the point zero one and all this sort of business and look, the technical building is amazing you know I'm I'm always gushing over people like Josh that can just he takes right, them yeah. and he makes more of the model you know but when I see like guys like yourself and Win like the stuff that Win did this year is just it, it surprised me that it didn't kind of really zing you know in the judges' eyes but um he he's such a gracious man like he he knows exactly what he's in it for and he got exactly what he's after. Um, I, I wanted to um, look at. Uh, I've got your a GM sniper now. I'm not sure when you did this one, um, but for me, it's it's a real masterclass in just taking an individual kit. And um, I, I I've got one. I've built one. And I don't think you've done a lot to the model as far as you know, like there's a scribing and adding on plate and modifying the kit heavily, but. Yeah. It's a great job. It's just this is what you can take with a kit and just give it a little bit of time, a little bit of love. And um, tell us a little bit about when this kit came, when you did this kit and sort of where you're at. And I guess in the kind of the, the timeline of, you know, Jordan becoming Ed and so on. 
Um, so I'm part of a, a group called Team Helios, and uh, it's it's a group of really great guys, like really really talented modelers. And uh, this was back in like 2014, 2015, something like that. And the whole the the whole thing is our group is themed with uh, white and orange. So they were like, you know, we're gonna launch our our build page and all that, and uh, everybody should just make like a white and orange kit. So I decided, you know, I had a gym sniper and I had it primed up, and I couldn't decide what colors to do on it. So I was like, orange and white. There we go. That's you know that works. So um, I love you know that that kit. It's it's funny because a lot of people, you know, yourself included, seem to really like him, and I do too. That's one of my favorite high grades that I ever did. Um. And it was, uh, I tried a couple new things with it. I remember trying, uh, I shaded, I shaded it with this kind of dark blue, um, like a dark blue color for the, to get the white kind of gradient that I wanted. And I just remember weathering it and like doing all these like little things to it. And I was, I had a lot of fun with it. And, you know, I, I, I haven't done a kit like that in a while where I've just kind of done, uh, you know, more basic stuff to it. I'm actually doing a, right now I'm working on a, a blue destiny and i'm kind of theming it after that where i'm just doing really tiny subtle things to it um and yeah i didn't i didn't mob that kid at all i didn't add anything to it i didn't scribe anything or add any you know crazy crazy boosters or you know do anything to it i think i think the only thing i did is on the shield i think i added two little like different things but i think that was it did you um did you this is, this is a sniper. Did you change the little intakes at all? I'm just looking at mine, and it's very square up there. Like, it looks like yours have been shaved back a bit, but I could be wrong. It might be. Um, I, I might have. <laughs> uh, it didn't I, seem I can't like remember off the top of my head. To kind of just have fun. One thing about the sniper that I think, uh, like, if what you've done with yours is exceptionally uh, far superior than mine but i did love this kind of edge chipping like it's really uh, obvious sort of here on when the pick comes up you'll see the two feet the, there's two things about the snipers it has a lot of these really cool little sort of square edges like the um the ankle armor is that sort of double bevel on mm-hmm. each side and there's and also because it's a sniper like if someone says sniper you go ghillie suit hiding in the jungle laying on their belly running around <laughs> kind of getting beat up you know living in swamps and stuff so it gives you that ability just to kind of like to turn it into a real war machine and give it that weathering that it deserves, you know, it's not the sort of machine right. that launches off white base for a 20 minute sortie against a bunch of Zaku's comes back, gets polished and rearmed and out it goes again. Like, and that yeah, was kind yeah. of problem with mine was like my sniper sort of sitting there just in a kneel position. There's cows next to it. So it hasn't moved in several <laughs> hours and the sniper gives that ability just to kind of take it into a full sort of war machine. Right. So, yeah. Kind of, I think that's kind of like what I see in yours as well. Something something I really liked about um, that kit and the Gym Sniper 2 in general is that it it is a sniper unit um, very clearly, but I always thought it was just really cool because you get the normal, uh, I forget the name of the rifle, but the little tiny rifle that they used during that era, and you get the shield and you get the beam savers. And honestly, I mean, besides the head, you take the, the gun away and it just looks like a like a a gym, like a really cool looking gym. Yeah. Yeah. And so I... I kind of was like, yes, my guy's like a little sniper, but at the same time, like, I, I remember I took a couple photos where I popped, like, the sniper parts off, like, yeah, the beam saber shot right there, mm. and uh, I was like, he's just like a combat unit, you know, he could be like a, you know, just like a, a really cool gym with a cool little helmet on. <laughs> yeah, which, so, which gives him a bit more kind of um, character in that he can go and, you know, if he's in an urban environment like that. The cover has got them kind of like cruising between some buildings. So he's doing the job. And the next thing he like, he gets flanked. And he's like, well, I need to get out of here. So yeah. there's a and cut mm-hmm. out and stuff like that. So, yeah, he's such an, yeah. as a character, such an all-rounder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, he was a lot of fun. I remember I remember building that. And uh, that one I, I still bring to like... Um, like when I, I I taught some classes at Comic Con and like when I when I when I go to different like shows and stuff and I bring kits to show off that's always one of the Fetty suits I always bring with me because I I've always loved that one he's a he's a personal favorite for sure <laughs> yeah I don't blame you can you see the picture of the three gyms there yeah yeah what, what's the what's the situation why do you have the three of them in the photo together 
Um, so when I finish a standalone model, I kind of like to throw it in with all of his brothers and sisters, quote unquote. So those were the other two gym kits that I had finished at the time. So I just wanted to take a photo of all my gyms kind of hanging out together. Um, they don't really correlate with each other. There's like not a theme with them. I just, you know, they're all gyms. I just wanted to take a photo of them all together. Uh, Cause, uh, gyms are yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got the goof. And can you tell me when you can see the goof pick? Yeah, it's loading. Um, the, uh, the brown one, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I took, I think I took that photo just because, um, those are, I think at the time, those are the only two kits I had done in like alternate color schemes that were different from the, the yeah, they, they were different from like the normal colors because the goof uh, custom uh, is obviously a, a, a blue one yeah, and the right. gym sniper is a blue unit. So I turned them into like an orangey, sandy, you know, color scheme. And I think, I think at the time, I'm looking at my shelves now. Yeah, I think. I think at the time, those are the only two that I had done alternate color schemes to. So I just wanted to take a photo of them together. And um, the goof, I think, you know, to this day, the goof is still another one of my personal favorites. So I think I just wanted to take a photo of them together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, um, do you, are you one of these people that can still snap a kit on a Friday night with a beer and sort of, you know, get a kick out of a, you know, like an oh, yeah. origin or something like that? Yeah, um, one of the best things about Gunpla, in my opinion, is the fact that you can enjoy it so many different ways. Um, you know, you, you can enjoy, you know, no matter what you do, you, you know, not everything you make has to be a Saise or a, or a We Are Gundam or, you know, a hummingbird like Tim did. You yeah. know, not everything you make has to be, like, better than the thing that you made previously. Sometimes you can just you know, put a kit together and like I have a, I just built a wing zero the other night. Um, and I put it on top of my tree and I didn't do anything too special with it. I just panel lined it with a pen. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I put the stick, I put the stickers on it and I panel lined it and I had fun with it. And, um, like, uh, this, you know, there's other little kits that I'll do and I, you know, I won't necessarily like do a big gallery on them or something, but sometimes I'll just get a kit and I'll put the stickers on it and I'll like do a little, you know, little, wash or something to it and i'll just have fun with it um and then other times i'll just i'll get a high grade kind of like the gym sniper and the goof and like you know several several other ones that i've done and uh you know i'll seam fix it i'll paint it up i'll decal it do a little bit of weathering flat coat it and i'm done and like i'm i'm happy building something like you know another sniper or this blue destiny that i've been working on and i get i love i love doing that just as much as i love doing like big you know kit bash insane builds like saisa and steam sage and all that and uh i think it's i think that's a really important thing and i'm glad you bring it up because i think a lot of people just kind of forget that like you know it's not the same for everybody you know i'm sure there's people that like don't enjoy you know the basics anymore but i think that's what makes gunplus so cool is the fact that you can do so many different things with it and you can again enjoy it at different levels you know, and at the same time, it's like, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you enjoy it. And I think it's important to kind of remember, like, you know, doing basic things can still be fun sometimes, you know, for certain people. I know it is for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I love I love all aspects of Gunpla. I love just snapping a kid up and having fun with it. And I love doing, like, big, crazy kit bashes with things yeah. flying everywhere. And, I, I imagine if yeah. you just put yourself, like, a little... A HD or something, it's kind of for you. Like, you, there's um, Saise and, you know, Steam Siege, and like, oh, and a HD is kind of like a kinder surprise egg, you know, for someone like you. It's like, <laughs> just going to open it. It's like, oh, there's, there's only like six pieces. Okay. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I sort of, I mean, I've got myself way too many hobbies this year. I think Gunpla has actually been a bit of a curse. It's sort of, um, like, I spent a lot of time up until last year kind of playing with uh, RC aircraft and drones and things like that. And it's because I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm a technical person, I work in electronics and stuff, and it really floated my boat for four or five years. Had some good friends, and I mean, when I moved into Gunplay, and again, it really opened up the artist in me, and it's you know, Tick was my whole little robot boy kind of thing and everything, but in the same way, it kind of it, it sort of unleashed 
like a creativeness in me. Like I'm good with my hands. I I built a um just from MDF and stuff on a retro pie. I built a, an arcade cabinet. You know, I love retro gaming. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, yeah it's really good fun. You know, and it's just I've got my wife is amazing at a couple of games that she played when she was a kid. You know, my daughter's up there playing Wonder Boy and stuff. And I just I just love it. And yeah, you know, I just recently um, bought a, a 3D printer. I tinkered at work with a couple, got work to buy them, and went. <laughs> There's my college paid for. <laughs> now, boy, you know, and I'm just like printing stuff, you know. It's and I'm I'm not designing these models, you know. Just there's so that's not the cabinet I build. That's a different cabinet, yeah. but you know, <laughs> Batman and just um recently someone. Yeah, that's I'm, awesome. I'm not into macros, but this is for someone. It's like a X9 Gaze. Oh, that's it's all, awesome. It's all, it's all in sections and stuff. It's kind of tacked together so that when he gets it, he's like, oh, because it would be a bag of parts. Um, um, right. Win. Recently, uh, this is a sort of semi-finished one. Not sure if you're familiar with the the arcade game Metal Slug. Oh it's, yeah, the Metal Slug tanks. Yeah, yeah it, that's it, awesome. I know Wave does a kit, but they're kind of out of print and stuff. So he's remodeled it. And now I've got it in like um, sort of in sections and stuff. Now, like I just love this oh, stuff. Yeah. So which is I can, that's I, cool. I can do two hobbies at once. I can sit here and do this, and I can kind of put a model because the, the the printer's like just there. <laughs> And so it's yeah. making while I'm making, you know, it, it just, so Gunpla for me has been great because it gave me a really good, you know, that's 12 months. There's about 45 builds in there and they're all half decent. Most of them are just top coated and weathered and stuff. But at the same time, mm-hmm. Gunpla has caused me to kind of like do other stuff. And now I'm torn between all these <laughs> different hobbies. But <laughs> just, last night I just smashed up I got a couple of um, IBO kits, which is just the simplest and greatest kit, but, if you love the story, you can have them and you can see them and you can go, man, great, great. So yeah, I, I yeah. where you're coming from, you know, if, you, if you're missing the basics, then either you're amazing, you're a Jedi, or you're missing out, one or the other, maybe a bit of both. <laughs> yeah. We might um, have a yeah. look at, Sorry, go on. Yep. No, no, I was just I was agreeing with you. <laughs> yeah. We might have a bit of a look at um, Steam Siege because um, it was, if, if you're okay with that, I don't want to kind of um, take back yeah, to something yeah. where you're like, oh, do we have to? Because I nearly died. No. And stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So again, just have a chat. I'll flick through it. And if you see pictures, I can flick back to them and stuff. Um, but um, yeah, like this is really pretty amazing. I know this one, probably for you, has that real. Um, trains and robots all together, and I, I'm semi aware of the story. And I, I really like the different texts, and it sort of tells a little bit of a story, you know, in the you know, the steam versus the diesel and stuff. And it just so just yeah, let, let us in on all that and what you were sort of thinking. Yeah. So um, again, my my other big thing obviously is is trains, and um, the past like two years, I've really gotten into uh, collecting train stuff and like working on train models and stuff. And that's kind of my other hobby is that I, uh, I collect like other vintage train things and just, you know, things like that. And, uh, I, I wanted to make a piece that showed off sort of the history of steam engines. And the whole thing is, you know, for people that haven't read it is, you know, way back in the day and, you know, forties, fifties, um, when diesel power and electric power sort of came into play, and that was like the main thing, um, it really threatened uh, the livelihood of steam engines. And you know, thousands upon thousands of engines were sent to the scrapyards. And there are amazing stories out there of railway men rescuing like certain engines and like keeping them in hiding, and you know, wow. buying them out and like putting them on trucks and driving them away to make sure that part of like history was preserved. And it was a uh, it was a battle in a sense. So I wanted to kind of physically put that in perspective that these engines, these steam engines, are fighting against the big conglomerate monsters that were the diesels. Because you know, from a technological standpoint, obviously diesel and electric power is much more efficient and inexpensive than coal powered steam engines. But it was an it was an unstoppable beast. You know, the wave of you know new age technology is. You know, no matter how good it looks or if you prefer steam over diesel, it's going to, you know, kind of overtake eventually, as does all evolution for technologies. And the diesel was supposed to be this big lumbering beast breaking out of, like, you know, this rail shed. And uh, he's got – it's really hard to see because I designed him 
kind of poorly in the way that I angled him, but there's actually like diesel engine cabs that line down his belly. You can see, you can so there's the, on the roof there. Yeah, there's a there's a big one on the top there, and then there's like three other little ones that kind of go down his stomach section. And I I base the whole uh, I love the Zeong. The Zeong is my favorite uh, Zeon unit. So the head of the the Zeong thing there is a modified master grade head that i did all these changes to and a lot of people didn't catch it but the cab head on his chest has the horns coming out just like the the normal head does and there's a there's a mono eye inside of the train head on his chest uh -huh. so there's, there's a zeong eye out of the zeong head and there's like an eye coming out of the train cab mm -hmm. um and uh yeah anyway it was just it was a big fight between you know these little tiny steam engine guys and this big lumbering beast of a diesel and uh, i wanted to make him all like black and oily and if you look on the diesel there's no chipping um because i wanted him to look more not new but like that he was not as battle torn as the steam yeah. engine guys the steam engine guys are more roughed up and rusty well, the diesel has, it's all black and it's gloss coated and there's like sludge and oil kind of dripping off of him. Cause that's, you know, what a lot of diesels took. Um, and the steam engines just have more of like corroded steam, you know, weathering on them. The, there's like ash marks around a lot of it. There's a, there's some, uh, you know, smoke effects kind of on the funnels and the feet are all rusted and dirty. And that's just how steam engines are, you know, they're, they're dirty beasts. Um, and uh, I, I had so much fun putting that together. And unfortunately, you can't really see it in any of the photos. But there were 33 LEDs in the whole thing. Oh, wow. And I had never soldered anything. I just ordered like a bunch of stuff from eBay. And I was like, all right, I'm going to teach myself how to solder this afternoon. So I just kind of sat down and was like, this goes here. This goes here. I'm going to melt this to this thing and wrap that around that. Oh, it turns on. Great. Shove it in the head. Good. Uh, the hands for the, there's four hands for the Xeon and all of them I built the same way. I, I took the, the hollow tube parts for the fingers and I took the frame out and I just put those parts on the wires for the LEDs. So he's got like wiry hands. If you look in between all the little notches, but wow. it just looks like mechanical and cool. Yeah, yeah. And there's in each one of his fingertips is a light. So it kind of uh, worked out in two ways for that because the wires just look natural for that bit. Um, but yeah, they, there's a, a whole work in progress blog I did for this. And it's really funny to see how I did the wiring, especially for the one Gundam that's being held up in the air by the one hand, because I had to put LEDs into that Gundam somehow. So I drilled through the chest and the, the LED wires go up through the chest for that unit and they go into the chest and the, the head and uh, they come out through the chest and they go into the hand of the Xeong part that's grabbing him. Oh, wow. And then they run down this copper tube and I built this copper tube part that goes up through the hand and it kind of plugs into uh, the guy he's holding. So it supports it really well. It's all supported with this big copper pipe. But, you know, he's being held up literally just by that, that metal rod that I, I soldered into the base. Um, uh, you know, it, it's as fun as the piece is to look at because there's so much going on. Um, I think what's almost more fun is just looking at how I built it because so much, like, fun, interesting things, in my opinion, went into it. Um, yeah, Jupiter there, uh, his foot is being... He's, the foot is the only thing touching the whole piece, and there's a big metal tube that goes up through that freight car that's cemented into the ground, and the metal pipe goes up in through his leg to support the whole kit. Um, so there's, like, detailed photos of all that on my blog and everything, but it, it was so much fun, like, putting it together because... With building, there's really, you know, it's there's a there's a process. It's like you put it together, you seam fix it, you sand it, you prime it, you paint it. You know, there, there's steps. When you build something like that, there are so many levels to it, and you just can't go in order with everything. For example, um, I couldn't put the hand on the the Gundam, the blue guy without painting them individually first, but I couldn't paint them until I 
like drilled holes and stuff. So it's like I had to go back and forth and like do things yeah. out of order. Like I had to paint things and then I had to modify parts. And it was like, it, it was crazy. It, it taught me a lot. And that's, um, you know, that's something that I think is the biggest thing I took away from that project is that it taught me so many different new things. And I thought, I think that was the most fun part about it was learning all this cool new stuff. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, one thing I noticed also about, um, so I say, and, the picture will come up as the guy that's he got the railroad axe and stuff, but he's got a big, um, like a, a, a box full of coal on his back. And it, it's like just for a second there when you kind of forget what you're looking at and you go, oh, mm -hmm. it's a train. And you, there's every kind of like, you know, say one part per, per 20 of the, of the visual area has got a little train trigger. Like that we're looking at the picture before of like his foot against the carriage, but there's cogs just sort of buried here yeah. and there. And so you just got all these little triggers, you know, you get taken into Gundam land and then you kind of go back to Thomas <laughs> the Tank Engine land, you know, I don't mean yeah. that, but you, you keep switching in. Oh, around. no, no. That, that's the fun. I, uh, the, f the funny thing is I, I collect vintage Thomas stuff and that's like a big joke with everyone. They're like, when are you going to build a Thomas Gundam? <laughs> so that's on the list. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even in that photo there, uh, the X on his back was a railroad crossing sign. Right. And a lot of people didn't really see that, but there's little like railroad crossing signs and like all these other little things. And, uh, the, the big ax that he's like about to slam down on the diesel was like a big railroad crossing sign. And, uh, I, I made that as a, it, it's a, it's a railroad crossing, but I, I didn't really tell anybody about this. Um, but the guy who ran GVWC in America was called, his name's Xavier and, uh, he retired the year that I built that. And I kind of built that X as like an homage to his name a little bit to be like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it kind of fit with the theme, but uh, it was like a last minute thing I thought about, but I was like, Oh, you know, there we go. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, there, there's all, there's all little yeah. train bits, you know, sprinkled throughout. So. Very, very, yeah. I noticed on the Xeong, it might be, it might be trivial. It might not be. He's like, he's got a little, he's got a crossing, but he's also got a, a skull. There is. What, yeah. Oh, every time I see that, I'm like, uh, trains and stuff what's with the skull is this a, like some sort of well you know i i could make up some big like philosophical thing about how like Just oh it's it. like a diesel engine and it's it's evil and like you know it has a uh, it has fuel in it and it has you know like you see tankers all the time it says like biohazard on it it's got the scroll the crossbone or like you know that I just wanted to put a skull on it because i thought it was cool and uh i liked the railroad crossing thing and i was like I could make a skull and crossbones with the railroad crossing. So yeah. that's what I did with it. Yeah. So yeah. that was really it. I just thought it looked, yeah. and it, you know, I was like, it looked, it looks cool with all the little grime parts on it. So I was like, yeah, it'll fit. <laughs> I think some of the next pictures I've got, I've got a few more of this and I don't, I purposely picked these ones because I don't think there's actually any, there might be touches of actual Gundam in the photos. And these are just pictures of Jordan building train dioramas. And there's carriages, and there's barrels, and there's boxes, and there's roofs with dirt on it, and there's vines creeping up the side of buildings and stuff. And it, you've got this. Uh, you're so fortunate to be able to slide in and out of the two. I'm like, I'm sure at some points, you've got all your Gundam stuff is out there, and you're looking at some boxes or a little switch set up, and you're just off in train world. You're totally irrelevant. Yeah. Like that's, that's very you're yeah. very lucky to have that to be able to kind of like disappear and it's the chill part of the whole dio. It's not just. Yeah. Water. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole thing was I wanted to build a world for them to fight in. And, uh, when you build a base, like how I did with Saisei, the base is more about just showing off, you know, the kit, just giving it a nice platform to stand on with steam siege and like bigger dioramas like that. I like to build a world and then put the things in the world interacting with, you know, each other but you know what they're doing is affecting the world that i built for them in a way mm. so you know th this this whole thing was this split second thing where this guy's bursting out of the building and he's attacking these guys but there's other little parts sprinkled around the place that are unaffected by this battle you know mm. yet and it's it's kind of a way to show off like there was a world here that was built and there's all these little pieces in it that could be destroyed in the next couple of minutes. You know, it's, it's like, this would be the next part of the story that gets like knocked over or whatever. And mm -hmm. I, it's funny what I ended up adding. Cause I had all these other little ideas for it. I was gonna, um, 
I was going to have a water tower being kicked over and I was going to have like water flying out of it. Like it was being punctured and like, there was like a, like a resin, like I was going to build it out of like a uh, resin or like water effects and just have the water kind of like spilling out of it. Wow. And I was originally going to have like all these little crew members like running away from the shed and stuff. And I just didn't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, oh, that scene there with the, the gyms on the flat car and everything that, that part of the diorama is my favorite part. I love that little, little shed thing. And like, it makes no sense. Cause like they're not in scale with anything. The whole like yeah. point is that I made up was that they're little statues being transported somewhere because on the box car behind them, uh, there's actually a Bandai logo that I put on very, very subtly on the box car. And, uh, <laughs> I just, I, you know, I just, I added it and I was like, this is fun. Like, I like this. I'm just going to put it in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, good. Yeah. And it's interesting. But, yeah. The little, the shed's yeah. got the smoke coming out. So it's like, like I grew up, um, part of my childhood was growing up without electricity, living kind of way out in the bush. It wasn't like we lived in a cave, mm. but it was quite low key. Right, yeah. You kind of kept the fire going, and you're like you're looking at that and going, "So is there like some guy hiding in there, like looking out the curtain while these machines go nuts, or is it still going?" <laughs> and he's off to work and stuff. The, the the distinct lack of human in this diorama it gives it a real. Um, an extra element of surreal to me because generally mm-hmm. like I said, people want to put in people to put it into the world. Mm-hmm. And it's it a lot of scale perspective, but um, the fact that there's no human, like I was looking at a few other pictures before there's one, it's just the corner of the, of the roof with some leaves on it. And, you know, I can easily see like the intro, the first scene of an anime is like just the breeze, just picking these leaves. Mm-hmm. Up. And the next thing it's like, Crump this like twenty meter half diesel half transformer thing to the uneducated <laughs> so crushes the building, you know. <laughs> yeah, I um again I was like gonna put people in it, but I just ended up not doing it. Uh, mainly, I think because of like time restraints and mm. you know it, it's it's a certain point. It's like I felt like I almost put too much detail in it. And I'm like I don't know if like the people would fit. So mm. and um. I don't know. Part of me really feels like when I build these guys, it's almost like they don't have pilots. It's just like the Gundams, like being like these sentient robot things, you know? And, uh, but you know, they could be, and you know, they, it kind of, you know, sometimes it tells its own story, you know, sometimes like you make up stuff afterwards or, you know, you make it up as you're building it. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned the human thing. Like I, I thought about it a couple of times, but I never really like deeply thought about like, yeah, there's like nobody in this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, um, I don't know. I really, I built it with the intention of there being people that exist in that world, but mm. you know, are you like, again, I think it's just, are you like super trained nerds? <laughs> so when you like say this guy here, the, the green build, did you have like mm-hmm. a, like a, like, excuse my lack of, train knowledge but did you take like the flying dutchman and model this kit around a particular <laughs> famous train or like this particular train in your historical knowledge was like a really fast train and so i took a kit that kind of went together and this train was renowned mm. as like a, a really kind of it wasn't fast but it had like a it could take a massive amount of cargo so i'm going to push that one together like that is it that do you have that much fun with it or am i reading too much into that- it the, the fun thing is like Gundam obviously is my main hobby. Like that's, that's what I've done. And I have more knowledge on like mobile suits trains. I have less knowledge of, but I know, you know, a bit about them, not as much as, you know, a, a crazy train enthusiast, but um, that is something that I didn't do for that diorama. Like they aren't really themed after any engines, The the color schemes were picked from different trains that I liked, but the the theme of them being you know as you said like themed after an engine and like have it designed after it didn't really uh i didn't really think about it too much but that is something that i have been thinking about and that i do want to do that in the future because there are so many cool trains with so many cool stories that i would love to build as robots because they just have such an interesting theme behind them like um there's a story about this engine you know, I won't go into it too much, but it's called the Big Boy. Its nickname is the Big Boy, and it is a massive, massive steam engine that was built in World War II, and it could haul the loads of three normal steam engines. Wow. And they built it to, you know, pull these, you know, megaton trains across the country in a fast, 
you know, in a, an efficient amount of time. And I always thought it'd be cool to make like this big hulking steam engine guy that was like three times the size of like all the other ones and nickname it the big boy. Um, and I, I do, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of British engines and, uh, I went over to England, uh, this past year here to study them. And there's a, there's a couple engines over there that I, I really, I took a liking to, and there's bits and pieces on them that I would love to incorporate in future builds. Um, a big thing over there is they have these, uh, these sort of rings around the boilers and you can actually see it on a lot of the, the Thomas characters. They've got these kind of red lines that go across the boiler and on a couple of the, the guys in the builds there, um, Hercules, which is the name of the blue one, he's got these round arms and he actually has these like 3D lines that I built around both of his arms to kind of be an homage to those boiler stripes. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, yeah, there's a couple other little things that I've kind of thrown in there. I originally, I, I have the piece somewhere. I originally built this intricate back skirt for him that was like, I, I dremeled out like all these lines and it was like, it was the back piece to the Arg Yagya, which is like a build fighters kit. It's got that big slopey back skirt and I cut them out so that, I mean, the plastic lines were very, very thin and it looked like a cow catcher from the front of a train. Yeah, and sure. I meant to build that as a piece and I ended up not even using it. <laughs> I scrapped it. Um, and then a lot of trains have, uh, they're like metal bars that are like handrails for the crewmen to hold on to while they're working on things. Or, you know, on the, on the front, there's usually a bar that they have to like pry open the smoke box when they clean it and do maintenance. And, uh, it, I don't know if I actually even put that in steam siege, but I, the original shoulder designs for, uh, Jupiter, which is the smaller one. He had, uh, like work handles kind of wrapping around his arms and, uh, the shoulder pads and stuff. Yeah. And, um, I, I kind of, you know, I designed little bits and pieces around that, and there are some, there are some trains that I really just want to build as a robot because, like, a lot of these are more about taking a Gundam and theming it after a train. I want to, like, with some of my next projects, I literally want to take a steam engine and design it as if it were a robot. So, like, the smoke deflectors on the side of the uh, the Flying Scotsman, I would take those and kind of incorporate them to be like maybe like chest flaps or something like that, or, you know, like the numbering or the color scheme or something like yeah. that. But yeah, that's definitely something I want to do. That's, it's good it's fun. interesting that you love trains. Yeah. That's your interest is mostly the, it seems to be mostly the British rail when, uh, but for me, uh, look, well, it doesn't, it doesn't help at the moment. I'm watching like the second season of, of Westworld and I'm like 10 years behind technology. So I'm playing like the first version of red dead and stuff. So the Western train, like you said, cow catcher, like mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. like the iconic state, you know, state. Just, just punching through. Yeah. So it's interesting that you're drawn more towards the British stuff. You know, I guess there's a, there definitely seems to be more of an, an elegance in the, there's probably mm-hmm. more, you know, although the, the American steam would have been steam. Yeah. Uh, and eventually once industry developed, they would have had their own. You know, I'm sure there's a, a long history of, of us built st- steam trains, you know, to punch across, you know, across the Midwest and things mm-hmm. like that. But um, British uh, steam, it has that, it has that aesthetic, that sort of that craftsmanship and that that complexity yet still beautiful and elegant and and functionality, yes. which sort of goes more so with you know a Gundam as opposed to a steam train. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, yeah it's uh, it's cool because I live very close to a lot of. I live in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is pretty much train central for America. And uh, they have a lot of steam engines that run here. There's a steam engine 20 minutes away from my work that runs like every year. And uh, they, they have like, there's a lot of history here. And uh, it's really funny that I ended up moving here because I used to vacation to this area all the time when I was a little kid. And uh, now that I'm an adult, I live in the area and it's really cool. Do you think that um, was but the train, I, as a boy seeing the trains and stuff? And Yeah, I am. Um, you know, again, it goes back to the origins, but I loved Thomas as a kid and I grew up with it. And, um, I, it's funny, you know, not to get into it too much, but I, I'm a big geek for the show and like, you know, all that stuff as a kid, because I grew up with it. And it's actually what got me into modeling because all the original sets were built, uh, with models, you know, all of it was filmed with gauge one trains. And I remember as a kid, like watching it. And I remember thinking like, it looks real, but like, I know it's not real. I know it's like, 
it's you know made up and it's like somebody made it but it looks so real and cool and as i got older you know that got me into like i did a little bit of model railroading as a kid and uh that just that really like set the trigger in my head about like building like railways and dioramas and like doing scale modeling stuff just because of that show hmm. um and even even as an adult i'll look back on it and i'll uh you know, I'll look at certain things and be like, that would be a good idea for like, a, you know, a fight scene or, a, you know, a diorama piece or something. And um, that's legit. It, it's very I, interesting. I don't think anybody that builds Gundam or is in a model at all can't watch some classic Thomas and appreciate, <laughs> you know, what's going yeah. on. The, the work that yeah, yeah. human beings have physically set this all up. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah, much, yeah. it's much like the, the old Thunderbirds stuff where yeah yeah, yeah. I watch that and i can see the strings and i can see how it's running along a wire but i'm like man they put some time they timed that fuse so that that as it flew across or as that bit of paper with clouds swirled behind it it was just yeah, yeah. You, know, you can see that the craftsmanship behind it yeah it, it's easy to say oh, yeah, yeah. A PG model but yeah, there was a real craft yeah about it yeah um it's it's cool i mean there's so many examples of that in media um you know, a lot of other kids shows like uh, like Tugs and Theodore Tugboat, and that was like a big thing. And then like um, I used to love like the claymation stuff, like Gumby. Like I grew up with Gumby as a kid, and like all that sort of thing. And like uh, even like Rudolph and like the Christmas specials and stuff that did all the, the puppeteering and everything. Yeah, yeah, Wilson Gromit. You know, uh, 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 Art Studios. Yeah, all that stuff's great. Eh? Yeah. Um, yeah, and. Uh, you know, growing up with that, I think I really just kind of planted the seeds in my head. It's it's cool because um, I'm actually friends with some guys that own original props from the show, and uh, you know, it's it's been an arm and a leg for them trying to acquire them, but you know, they're they're safely in their hands and everything. And it's it's so cool looking at these things that they used, you know, twenty something years ago, and they filmed on screen with, and like looking at the way that they modeled them and they painted them, mm. and it's. It's very funny that as an adult, when I got into painting, I'm, I'm a big fan of like the pre-shading and, you know, putting darker bits in, you know, certain areas. And when I look back at the models and everything, they painted them in the same way that I paint my Gundams now. And I think that really yeah. implanted that as a kid in my head, thinking about like how they painted them. And, you know, they, they never just painted them like a flat color they painted them, you know, with shades and they, they weathered them and they put things on the actual props that made them look like, you know, not just like a toy. It looked like an actual, you know, yeah, a, a, a model of road. Yeah. But again, they had that tricky oh. thing. You've got a beautiful train, but then you've got a face on the front with a mouth moving. So <laughs> yeah. They take you in and out of that fantasy and scale, which is what I think guys like yourself and guys that, that clearly enjoy building, you're not there to go, here's my perfect, you think this one to one because I took a photo of it with the right lighting uh, or, <laughs> or well, here's my, here's my silly fun. And that's all good too. But you guys, when you build, it's like you're looking at it and you see a robot, then you see a bit of train. You're like, Oh yeah, yeah that, that, that's fun for people to look at. And like you said, you, you, you don't walk away from a GBWC with, with a medal. But you walk away knowing that a whole bunch of people would have went, oh, my God, it's, there's that. And who knows, Steam dudes might be walking through there with their grandchildren and they're like, what? Yeah, the, yeah. Hang on. And you, that, that's just bringing our generations together. That's good. I I remember distinctly, you know, again, I, we talked about this earlier about how I love the, the whole thing that really got me to Gunplo and, like, wanting to do it at a better level was um, – Big, you know, big shout out, big inspiration was Vegeta two fifty nine Henry, who uh, you know him and I are, are very close friends now. But as a kid, I, I always looked up to him, and I always loved his work. But the thing that made me look up to him the most was the fact that he he wasn't like all the other guys that were like really intense model builders at the time that I tried to reach out to. You know, I was I was like what you know 14 15 years old when i started getting into gunpla and i just remember like i had all these dumb questions and he always took the time to like answer them and be kind and like he was very patient with me and you know over the years you know him and i we talked a lot and i learned a lot and i didn't really have the tools to to do you know things like how he did and i hand painted all my kits because i couldn't afford an airbrush at the time 
And, you know, long story short for the, the story that people don't know, um, one day he retired and he hung up the, the rack for good. And I came home to this, this massive box and it was all of his tools and it was his airbrush and like the booth that like I watched as a kid, like him create these masterpieces with. And he just, he, he gave me a simple note that said, uh, I can't give you the skills but i can give you the tools to get there and he said thank you for inspiring me so him and i really like you know had this bond of master and student in a way and this was like him passing the sword down to me and i just the the love you know i've gotten from him and like so many other people and eventually you know he got back into the hobby and him and i kind of became rivals and then like we eventually met at uh, gbwc it brushed back i really liked it and <laughs> no, I uh, I told him that like when he gave me a thing, I was like, "You don't have to do this." And he's like, "If I ever get back in the hobby, he's like, I'm gonna buy all new stuff anyway, so don't worry about it." So he did. He eventually got back into it, and I there was like a couple little like things that he couldn't find that he wanted back that I wasn't using. I was like, "Yeah, sure." Um, but eventually, we met on stage at GBWC, and we both placed. And uh, there's this photo of like him and I with like you know got our got our arms around each other and we're shaking hands and everyone's like master and student turned to rivals and like it was this yeah. it was this great thing it was it was good fun and anyway the, the whole story is it goes back to him he he inspired me so much and that's that's really why I wanted to get good at Gumpla and I wanted to start going to GBWC is because I wanted to inspire people and like that sounds like I don't want to toot my own horn or anything but like. I wanted to get good so people would say, I want to get that good. And like, I want to do something like that someday. And I want people to know that they can, because like I was once the guy looking at Henry and, you know, all these other guys that made really good gun club, And I didn't think that I could ever do anything like that. But Henry was like the guy that said, you can do it. And I did do it. And now I want to, you know, return the favor. Yeah. And I went to, a. Uh, I took Steam Siege to a IPMS event, and that's like a you know like an inter international plastic modeling thing, and uh, it's called MosquitoCon. And we were there with you know my God, these military modelers, like the most amazing stuff I've ever seen in person, just yeah, yeah. class work, amazing pieces. And there was this little kid there running around, and he was so excited to see all the Gundams, because, like, I had stuff there, and, like, my friends all brought the Gundams. And he was all excited about the Gunpla. And I remember he went up to mine, and he's like, this one's really cool. This one's my favorite. Like, I want to do something like that someday. And I just, like, I was like, oh, man. Like, that's that meant the world to me. And uh, so the kid actually entered the, the junior category with a Gundam, and he won first place with his kit. And I was like, that's so cool, man. I was like, hell yeah, you know? So it's, it's um, you know, for me with GBWC is I entered it, again, with the intention of I just wanted to build something cool and show it off to the world and kind of put it out there and, like, maybe someone would walk away, away from that event and be, like, inspired to build something like that. Yeah. And, you know, over the years, I think I've definitely gotten more competitive with it, just, you know, out of friendly, you know, rivalries and you know things that happen in my local scene but i think what i really wanted to get back to especially this year with him is i built this without the intention of placing i didn't build this to go to japan i didn't build this to walk away with an award i built this just because i wanted to get back to my roots of like i want to build something fun and cool mm -hmm. and like put it out there for people to smile at you know and if i made somebody smile with it at the end of the day i think that's like a win for me you know yeah. so oh, that's that's a big there's, thing for me there's so much in what you just said there that it's really important. You know, it just goes to show that, um, like, A, you said, oh, I want to build to show others they can build, much like Henry did for you. But you can do it with an attitude, and this can be done in any aspects of your life. You work with people at work and, you know, you have other relationships. And, you know, doing it as in a, hey, you come and walk beside me as opposed to follow me, this is the way it's done, you know, that aspect. Yeah. And, and that's what really makes... Um, some people really stand out amongst the crowd and whether they place or not. Um, the, the other aspect, I suppose, we've got this thing in our fridge which a friend gave us once and it wasn't because we needed the, the, 
the reminder or anybody does but there's times when i'll remind myself there's a little saying where it's like you know if you if you chase the butterfly it won't catch you but if you sit stand still it'll just land on your shoulder and it, it feels yeah, like yeah. that's kind of like i've seen i've done a probably about a dozen interviews this year with guys like yourself that have kind of like really been chasing the butterfly and you know <laughs> just kicking their toe on rocks and running in the branches while they're looking up in the air and then, then they just they just stop and it just lands on their shoulders. And regardless of what the outcome was, they get to just enjoy the butterfly for a change, you know. Um, and we're all going to do it in aspects of our life, but it's it's really good that you can uh, use that to – because we are chasing butterflies in every other aspect of our life. We're, we're trying to get promotions at work, and we're trying to keep our family happy and fed and stuff. And at the end of the day, we can just slow down. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, I think probably like, – You've, you've given me so much of your time, um, and I really, really do appreciate it. Um, just so I don't forget, we'll go through a few plugs. Now, I've got um, the just the Jordan Nieder, um page here that I'm going to bring up because it, it has sort of a, some really good um, – it might be a while for you, but it has a lot of your photos. This is where I got most of your photos from. I found it sort of easiest to kind of like pull a heap down for today's purposes. Um, it also no. – it shows a lot of, uh, you know, you mentioned Mosquito Con and, and things like that. So you know, there's, there's some history. There's some 2016, 2015, just general entries of, you know, stuff going on. And it gives a real sense of, you, you know, your what you lay uh, an importance on um, community as well, as opposed to just I'm building and until I build the best, I'm just going to keep building. You know, you can see mm-hmm. that there's a lot more in Gumpla and the train stuff um, than than um, just, you know, being a winner sort of thing. So do you want to kind of um, give some plugs on where people can kind of keep in touch with you and follow you and get get their inspiration? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, that again, that's like my personal Facebook, and I let anybody add me because I love meeting people from all over the world to build. Oh, sure. um, so you, you're allowed to add me. Like, that's fine. Like, I use my Facebook just as more of a, like, a you know, it, it is my personal life, but it's a lot of like community things and building things. Um, you can follow my, my my handle everywhere is Double O Gundam Reviews V two. I made it when I was like thirteen as my YouTube channel. <laughs> um, so that's that's my page everywhere. It's it's two zeros Gundam Reviews V two. That that's it. Um, that is my my Facebook page, my Instagram, um, and I have a Twitter, but I don't use it that much. Uh, and my, the, the best place to follow me, like for my, my big posts about like my finished builds and my work in progress is, um, I post all my work in progress stuff. Like, you know, it's, it's all over my Instagram and my Facebook pages, but, um, the detailed blogs where I kind of talk about everything in more detail is, uh, my blog. And it's, I, I believe it's just Gunplow with Ed at Blogspot. Um, if you just Google Gunplow that or Ed's Gundam and figure or whatever it's called, um, it'll come up. Uh, so really, you know, th- those two places, um, I have a discord. Um, it, you can't really like say discord links cause it's a bunch of numbers, but on my, on my, uh, my Facebook page, the double O gun reviews page, there's a link like at the first place where you can come join. Um, it's a great group of people. We just talk and hang out and, uh, talk about Gunpla and, you know, enjoy each other's company. And, um, uh, I think that's about it where you can like follow my stuff. Um, those are the big ones I'd say. Um, and then I, I do have a YouTube channel, which I plan on uploading. Uh, I've been working on a couple things actually for my YouTube channel. That's the, the YouTube channel is where I started, you know, all my Gundam stuff. I didn't even have a Facebook when I started on YouTube. Um, but I have a, I have a series called Gunplay with Ed where I work on kits and I haven't done an episode in quite a while. But I will say uh, one will be coming in the future with a very interesting sponsor. So uh, stay tuned good. for that. Good, good, good yeah. to hear. Good to hear. Uh, look, I just there's there's often um, when people can make you know some sort of living or personal benefit from from the hobby. It's it's so good to see. There's, there's some people that can kind of go. You, you got to understand they're kind of beyond hobby level, and that's fine. Um, and it's really good to see people that are getting some sort of like uh, benefit from you know their chosen art because we all want to do what we love the most. So that's great to hear. Yeah, yeah cool. All right, mate. Look, as I said, um, thanks so much. And um, I, I, I feel that uh, 
I know that Jordan's not going to be having a nap till 10 tonight and working right through till the next day and then going to work the next day, something like that. So enjoy the time off. I'm sure you're already thinking about what's going on next. And, you know, I really hope, oh, you, can, yeah. I hope you can hold that sort of that, that tranquility of I'm just, I'm just going to dig this. And because it, it, it's a cycle, isn't it? And as you mature, you're going to kind of go in and out of, you're going to be like this close, like James Denise has been like this close, like a dozen times just here in Australia. Yeah. So, you know, everybody has their times. So yeah, mate. When it's, look, when it's my time, it'll be my time. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. All right. I appreciate your time. Um, we'll, we'll stay in touch. I'm always following your stuff. So, and um, awesome, buddy. Thank you heaps. Awesome. And, uh, hey, thank best, you. All the best with your building, and uh, we'll be watching you closely. Thanks, awesome. Man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. No problem.